This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Hey, it's Greg Stanley, and we are reviewing a special, amazing, incredible Formula One race car. And if you listen to this podcast in the past, you know I'm not so much a Formula One expert, so I have brought in a Formula One expert, uh, Felix Archer. Felix, how are you doing today? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate you joining us today. And if you're watching our video, you'll see the car we're talking about, which we'll go about here into in depth here shortly. But first, Felix, if you would tell us what do you do for RM Sotheby's and kind of your path to today in the car world? You know, like how, how did you get started? Um, what kind of cars you like growing up? And then what do you do today? So growing up, um, we were kind of a, an Aston Martin family. Um, as strange as that sounds, my grandfather was the chairman of the club and my, my uncle uh, raced pre-war Astons as well as my dad. Um, and they grew up working on Nick Mason's cars uh, wow. and racing with him in the 80s. So that's how they got into racing. Um, and although I grew up in a bit of an Aston family, my father always raced Porsches. So whilst I kind of have a, a duty to like Aston Martins, um, my actual passion lies with Porsches and in particular competition cars, because that's kind of, I grew up in the race paddock. Um, and back in, when I was growing up in the nineties, um, sorry, that's my doorbell. Um, okay. I, you know, these incredible cars were being raced um, because they were kind of in a, you know, in, in the point where they were going into a low value and were just a, you know, a usable item, they weren't particularly a collector's item. So I was able to see some incredible cars that had, you know, two years before that been at Le Mans and now were just a usable track toy. So I'm very much into the racing cars and into the Porsches. Um, okay. So you were into Aston Martins, but really into Porsches. So how did your career with RM Sotheby's start? So in my early 20s or late teens, early 20s, I was actually, um, I was in music. I was a musician and um, I was uh, touring in a band and um, that was really good fun and uh, kind of life changing. Um, but obviously a shelf life of a touring band is actually quite short. Right. Um, so I was very, very lucky to have the other passion, which was cars. Um, I knew nothing about the car market. I just knew a bit about cars. Um, so when I found out that there was actually this, these huge, crazy festival like events, um, and boutique events, I was just like, I've got to, I've got to work for this company, um, and really, really harassed the members of staff to give me a chance to have an interview. Um, and in a, around about early 2017, I did some work experience for the company, um, following up with hey, can I come and work for you in the office? Give me something to do, I'm begging you. Squindo can uh, vouch for that. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, I just banged the phone constantly uh, and eventually landed a role as a specialist. So four years later, here I am um, as a car specialist in the European team, but I work out of London in the UK. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's really great. Yeah, and I know uh, when I wanted to do a special on this Lewis Hamilton F1 car, uh, Ian said, well, you know what, give Felix a call. So if you would, can you kind of dig into this F1 car a little bit? Tell us a little bit about it, why it's so significant. I know we've had, had a lot of really cool press videos and releases on this, but just the importance of this car. Um, obviously, it's one of the most significant F1 cars to come to market in the history of the market, I would assume. Uh, yes. There's been some Schumacher cars in the past, but uh, I think this might be the most significant one ever. So if you would just kind of talk to that a little bit. It's probably the biggest mystery as well, um, because this has never, ever happened before. No one has ever publicly offered a Lewis Hamilton car. Um, the, the strange thing, of course, is he's still, he's still winning. Um, you know, you're buying a piece of this legendary driver's story. Um, and if you buy it, there's every chance that the stock value of it could rise if he carries on winning championships. So that's a really interesting sort of side note. Um, but no, obviously you're buying a, a Lewis Hamilton car, but the 
the story of the car itself is it's a 2010 McLaren MP425. Um, obviously, uh, up until you know fairly recently, all the McLarens were called MP4 slash something. So you would have this the famous Senna car, the MP44, which was the 88 car, won 15 out of 16 races, um, legendary car. And then you have the Hakkinen era, and then you have the sort of Raikkonen era, and then leading on to the Hamilton era of McLaren and Hamilton and McLaren um, got together when he was about 12 years old um, and McLaren started funding him in go-karts um, after seeing that he was winning everything he sort of you know took part in um, right the way up to his Formula One debut in 2007 where he was in a MP4 22 um, up against his teammate them who was Fernando Alonso um, and they had a very famous falling out in 2007. Um, and he was the new hotshot driver um, that McLaren knew his, you know, McLaren knew Hamilton's potential, but Alonso, who was then the reigning world champion who came from Renault, was expecting to walk, to wipe the floor with this guy. Um, and of course, that's not what happened. Hamilton turned up um, and actually uh, sh should have won the championship, very nearly did. Um, and they had a huge falling out because Hamilton at the end of the day was quicker than Fernando Alonso, who was basically the king of F1 at the time. Alonso was the man that beat Michael Schumacher and Hamilton comes out first race around the outside of, of turn one in Australia. And everyone's like, oh, this kid's actually really quite good. Um, Hamilton obviously then won his first championship in 2008 with McLaren um, on the last corner of the last lap of the last race, um, which was the crazy title decider. And then in 2009, the rules changed for Formula One. And because Ferrari and McLaren were the front, were the, were the front running teams, right. they were trying to outdevelop each other so much that at the end of 2008, they'd focused so much on the 2008 car that um, they hadn't really worked on the design of the 2009 car. Right. Um, and that's when Braun came out in 2009. And had basically become this brand new team. Braun were Honda in 2008. And Honda had, had done the opposite of McLaren and Ferrari, had written off their 2008 and were focusing entirely on 2009 because it was a huge engine, a huge change in rules. They were moving from groove tires to slicks. The dimensions of the cars were, were changing and the aerodynamic concept of the cars was changing. So, McLaren and Ferrari came out in 2009 with rubbish cars um, and were basically at the back. So Hamilton, who was world champion, um, was struggling to get into the top 10. He was muscling his way, uh, muscling the car around tracks and um, just about getting on the podium just by sheer talent. But his teammate, Heike Kovalainen, was really struggling. Um, and so 2009 was basically a sort of recharge season for McLaren and Ferrari, the, the sort of top teams right um the 2010 comes along braun were world champions and jensen button who won for braun signed for mclaren so at the beginning of 2010 the expectation is you know hopefully these guys can claw it back and lo and behold they do they've got a race winning car again um and it's a really close season and the, the really interesting thing about this car specifically is there's a device on the car at the time called the F duct, which was an aerodynamic device, which would stall the rear wing. It would basically redirect airflow through the car to stall the rear wing, AKA creating less drag. And the way the driver would do that was they would take their hand off the steering wheel and, and cover a hole in the cockpit. Wow. And, and the air was coming through the cockpit via a duct at the front of the car, which was actually on the F of the Vodafone. Um, that's why it's called the F duct. Um, and making the car slightly faster, faster down the straights. Obviously, the concept was adopted by all the other teams by the middle of the season and then banned because no one wants to see 20 F1 drivers driving one-handed uh, for most of the lap because it's just insanely dangerous. Um, and that season was very, very interesting because... I think it was about five drivers went into the last race with a chance, with a mathematical chance of winning the championship. Hamilton being one of them, uh, Button being another, Alonso um, and Sebastian Vettel. 
Vettel eventually won the championship. But this car came second in the Constructors' Championship, uh, but not by much. Uh, so it was a very competitive car. And there's not many cars in history. Um, if you take the innovation aspect of this car, there's not many cars in history that have two current world champions driving the car. Um, you'd be, it'd be very, very difficult to find one um, in the modern era where that's been the case. Right, right. Yeah, and I'm going to pull up some pictures here of the car so folks can see what we're talking about. Uh, now, where has this car been for the last 10 years or so? Uh, or can we not say? It, was it a kind of, a, you just don't see them come to market, obviously. Um, it's just amazing the, that this thing is available. McLaren, um, famously and rightly, um, are very guarded about their stock um, and their heritage. Um, and essentially, no, it's very hard to, to get a car out for McLaren um, because, you know, at the end of the day, um, these cars are so special and they're sort of museum pieces, they're works of art, and each chassis has a different story. Um, so whilst at the end of the year, uh, all the cars are rebuilt and then put into storage with a dust sheet over them, it's pretty amazing that this car ended up being outside of McLaren, mm. uh, restored in 2019, and now ends up in, well, it's now ended up in the UK, uh, where it will be sold. Um, it's recently been to McLaren again to be meticulously looked over, um, as well as Mercedes, who obviously um, the engine was a Mercedes, so Mercedes are involved and in, uh, do various health checks on the engine. Um, but yeah, it's 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 crazy that this car is out of McLaren um, because one, finding a Hamilton car is nearly impossible. Two, finding a Hamilton McLaren and then a Hamilton button McLaren is yeah, it's it's very very difficult. Um, so it's such a rare opportunity. And I know we did a really nice video that just showed how important this car was and it gave the stats on Hamilton and everything was, you know, number one in points, number one in pole positions, number one, and, you know, all sorts of amazing stats. And there was only one tie, wasn't there? The only one that he was in the tie for number one was Schumacher for number of world championships, correct? That's correct. Um, and if you just take raw, raw speed versus the, you know, and the number of races they competed. Michael Schumacher competed in more races than Lewis Hamilton currently has competed in. And Michael Schumacher achieved 68 pole positions. And Hamilton is on 100. Wow. Which is just extraordinary. So he's a real, just on pure pace and ability um, around one lap. Um, he's so far ahead of everyone else. Um, and of course, he's on... Uh, more wins than Michael Schumacher as well, um, more podiums. It's just about every record he's ahead. Um, and it's just the equal on the seven world championships. And no one thought that that seven world titles would be equaled, let right. alone. And now it's very statistically, it's statistically likely that Hamilton will beat that record. Right, right. Yep. And before we go, I'll go too far ahead here, uh, when and where is the car available? The car is available at the British Grand Prix, which takes place on the... It, we are selling it just before the first ever Formula One sprint race, which is on Saturday, the 17th of July. Um, the race is obviously on the Sunday, but it's an interesting format. And it will also be the first Grand Prix with a full attendance um, since 2019, um, which will be... Yeah, it's going to be a very, very special event. Now, I do have a picture pulled up here of the cockpit. Is it possible to see the little hole that you talked about, or is it not possible in this picture? It might not be, but um, <laughs> but it's it, on closer inspection, you can see it. And it's actually, um, it's a remarkably simple thing to drill a hole in the side of your cockpit um, right. to have such a, a, a pace gain uh, down the straight. Um, right. But it's, yeah, it's okay. a... It, the, the 2010 cars are also quite identifiable by the, the long fin behind the cockpit, which actually came back later. Um, but again, it's all for aero stability. Um, and it was a very eye-catching design of that year. 
Now, are these cars drivable in any sanctioned race forum? Not yet. Uh, there's no race series for these cars, but if you wanted to drive the car, you could ring up McLaren Heritage tomorrow and say, I'd like to drive the car at Silverstone in three weeks time. Um, how do we do that? And the answer is with McLaren's help, quite easy. Um, they have the facility to be able to help you learn to drive the car and um and yeah it's crazy you can go and you can not only own the piece of history but you can also drive the piece of history um you can't drive the mona lisa um but you can drive this car and it's in my opinion um a really significant part of the history of formula one and and lewis hamilton's history too Right. Yeah, you can do it with a lot of McLaren's help and a lot of insurance, right? <laughs> well, I think before anything, a lot of bravery. Right, right. Yeah, because I know these things are just incredible, insane. What's the red line on these cars? 14,000 RPM, something crazy like that? What is the red line on these things? I'll tell you what, I can find out. Um, uh, let's have a look, shall we? <laughs> it's going to be high. Probably over 14,000 at this point. 18,000. Oh my gosh. Wow. Mm. So just imagine these things, you know, screaming around the racetrack. Wow. Well, is yeah, there and, these, um, and, and don't forget these, these were V8 engines that still banged out a huge, a huge noise. In 2014, they went to turbo hybrid engines, which sounded completely different, had a much lower tone, a much quieter sound as well. So it's one of the last four years um, where F1 was still crazy loud. Uh, is this the hole? Oh, I, I can't see uh, I can't see the screen. Oh, that's the... Uh... If you're not joining us on video, there is a shot of some carbon fiber, which looks like a hand cut out hole. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm just trying to, uh, there we go. It's a very up close picture. So I'm assuming that's probably the hole that we've referenced here. Yeah, I, I lost the picture there. Okay. Doesn't look very um, professional. Uh, looks like it was kind of done on the, you know, on the side, so to speak. Yeah, well, in that case, it's probably it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, but well, it, but so, yeah, it was, um, it was, uh, it, it, you can see, you can see on all the onboards, just on the straights, just the, the hand going. Uh, or maybe it was actually the elbow, but you can see a hand coming off the wall, uh, off the um, off the wheel, which is, yeah, um, yeah. It's sure. not. It's not. Um, the F duct is not fitted on the car today, um, and I assume it's a, well. Firstly, it was an option, so they didn't run it at every race, um, and the decision was made when restoring the car. Um, to restore it to a spec without the F-duck. Understandably, um, I would like to focus on the driving of the car first rather than trying to maximize my lap time by taking my hand off the wheel. Um, yes. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, that's awesome. That's really great. I appreciate you kind of helping us learn more about this car. Is there anything else you'd like to mention about this special McLaren? Turkish Grand Prix 2010. Um, it's... It's, it's famous for a number of reasons. One, Sebastian Vettel and, and Mark Webber taking each other out um, in both in the Red Bulls. And then Button and Hamilton having a crazy duel um, for the rest of the race. Um, probably the most well-known race that year and most talked about. Um, and this very car was the, was the car that won the race. Um, it was also, and it's a quite a, it's a, quite a fitting bit of footage um, for those that are interested. Um, at the Chinese Grand Prix, Hamilton um, spent two or three laps trying to get past Michael Schumacher, who was in a Mercedes that year, who had just come back. And there's some very fitting footage of Hamilton overtaking Schumacher. Um, and that was a, a, a long-awaited duel um that many people wanted to see and it was fantastic um it was quite cut quite symbolic um when he managed to get past and right I, yeah. anyone with foresight i i i think um he has to be spoken about in the same breath as schumacher and senna that's what i would say right 
Yep. And I totally agree with you on that. So, well, I appreciate you reviewing this wonderful, incredible car with us. And like I said before, uh, I do have a little game I like to play at the end of this. <laughs> so this is where I got to have a little bit of fun and you get to have a little bit of pain. Uh, so I'd like to pick three cars and it's called Keep, Cash and Crush. I'm going to give you three cars. You have to pick one to keep forever, one to cash in, and then one to send to the crusher. Now, I wasn't cruel and I didn't pick actual Formula One race cars, but I did pick Formula One derived powered cars, I guess is the best way, where the engines maybe had a, some influence from the Formula One team cars. Okay. So three cars. The first car I'm giving you is a Ferrari F50. Mm -hmm. The second car I'm going to give you is a Porsche Carrera GT. And then the mm -hmm. third car, which is kind of a curveball because it is a little bit of a newer car, is the Aston Martin Valkyrie. So we got a Valkyrie, we've got a Carrera GT, and we got an F1, or an F-150, a Ferrari F-50. So which one will you keep forever? Which one will you cash in? And which one will you crush? Keep the, uh, keep the Carrera GT. Crush the Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll sell my slot of the Valkyrie because I don't believe it will ever be finished. <laughs> okay. All right, that's fair. I agree with I you. I realize I've just derailed. If anyone is listening and has a slot in the Valkyrie, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, that really shows your love for Porsche because that's actually the least valuable car of all three of them. So, well. I don't know. I just get in. I feel like I'm, I, I'm, I'm, maybe I'll be shot tomorrow for saying this. I just, an F50, I once went in one and I just had this sort of impending feeling that it would catch fire. <laughs> Uh, you can feel that when you're driving a couple million dollar car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it wasn't. I felt like getting in a mirror. I just thought, well, shall I have the extinguisher on my lap or just underneath? <laughs> <laughs> well, how about the Porsche? Since you're a Porsche guy, how about the Carrera GT? What is it that you love about the GT? Um, I think the engine is spectacular. It's got a manual gearbox. Um, it's a race derived engine. Um, I think it's the kind of last of an era. I don't think it's particularly the best looking car, um, but there's just, uh, it's just, it just is magic. Um, that's why. Okay. No, that's a great answer. Well, thanks again, Felix, for, uh, you know, walking us through this Formula One car, telling us more about it and uh, sharing some of your passion for automobiles, man. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very, very much. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at the Collector Car Podcast.